The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Christ. King Herod heard of the deeds of power, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod married her. For John had been telling Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod on his birthday gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. When his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, Ask me for whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, Whatever you ask me, I will give you, even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, What should I ask for? She replied, The head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, and gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. the one holy and living God. Amen. Amen. Well, I'll lead with a confession. When I read the gospel for the first time this week in preparation, I did a little looking around to see which of my colleagues could maybe step in and do it instead. <laughs> this is not a feel-good story from our scriptures. Uh, and, and I found myself wondering what, why, why is this here? We, this is, there's nothing theological about this. It's not a parable. It's not a prophecy. It's not, what is it doing here? And so, uh, so I spent some time with that and I started by just thinking more about what actually happened. It is a little bit of a confusing story in some ways. It's a lot of characters involved. So let's just look at it one more time. Firstly, it's a flashback. We don't use that literary device too often in scripture, uh, but it's Herod hearing about things that Jesus has been doing out in the world, and his reaction to that is to say, oh my God, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. 
And then it tells the story of, of how John the Baptist died, because it's news to the reader that that has occurred. So, so Herod, Herod thought John was interesting. He was a little scared of John, a little freaked out by him and what he could teach and what he was telling. And John was a big character too, so probably how he was presenting information was a little overwhelming. And so when Herod decided to marry Herodias, or maybe when Herodias decided to marry Herod after leaving Herod's brother, uh, which is kind of unheard of, you know, in, in a lot of the culture at that time, when they decided to marry each other, John the Baptist said, time out, no, this, this is unlawful, this is a bad thing to do, don't do it. And so Herod, Herod because he was intrigued by John and liked to listen to him even if he was unsettling, threw him in jail just to get him out of, this, out of his, his area of influence, right? He, if he wasn't in front of him saying that, Herod didn't have to think about it anymore. Herodias, on the other hand, wanted him dead from the get-go. She didn't like John trying to interfere in this plan she had, and so she wanted him gone. She was not happy. So this goes on for a little while, and then, and then Herodias Jr., right? There's Herodias' mom and Herodias' daughter. Uh, Hero she, he has this birthday party. Herodias' daughter dances for the people beautifully. Must have been incredible, right? Because he says, I'll give you whatever you want. That was so amazing. So whether Herodias' daughter was just really in her mom's pocket, or just a really obedient girl, or she knew how much her mother hated John the Baptist, she went to her mother and said, what should I ask for? And, and I mean, it was the golden opportunity, right, for Herodias to get what she finally wanted. I want John the, Baptist, John the Baptist's head on a platter. And because a man's word is his bond, Herod had no choice, in his mind at least, uh, but to honor the request, because he had said, I will honor the request, and, and he had John beheaded. And, and that's, that's the, possibly the most soap opera thing in our entire scripture. I mean, just the whole thing is just, it, it could be on a soap opera. So it got me thinking about the rest of John the Baptist's life. All of this got me thinking about the bigger picture of who John was. John had made his whole life out of proclaiming the Messiah, the coming of the Messiah. Everything that he did, everything he was about, was about proclaiming the coming of the Messiah. So much so that I, it was even in utero. He was born to Elizabeth. Elizabeth and Mary were pregnant at the same time. My favorite, one of my favorite stops on, our, on my trip on the Holy Land was at the site of the visitation. There's this incredible sculpture of Mary and Elizabeth meeting. And, and Elizabeth is just a bit rounder than Mary. And the look of care in Elizabeth's eyes when she meets Mary is just, just so beautiful. Somehow somebody captured that in stone. It was remarkable. But, but when Mary got there, it says the baby leapt in her womb, and Elizabeth knew that her Lord had come near. John the Baptist proclaimed to Elizabeth that the Lord was in front of her inside Mary. So at the very beginning, everything about his life was proclaiming, 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 the Messiah is coming. Now it got weird, no doubt about it, John the Baptist is probably the strangest character in the New Testament. He was big and bushy, and he wore camel's hair, and he had this big beard. He was famous for being loud and crazy, and he, he ate locusts dipped in honey, and you can just see the, the honey dripping down his beard, right? I mean, he was just this ferocious-looking character, this amazing character that, that got in people's faces, repent! Repent, 
He's coming. Make, make straight the path. And he, you know, he probably wanted Jesus to be more of that, that big energy just like him too. You know, he said he's going to burn away the chaff. He's going he's gonna, to he's gonna cut you down. Get right. Get righteous. Over and over, that was what he proclaimed over and over to the people. Now, it might have been disappointing. It must have been disappointing that Jesus kind of came in this meek, mild, compassion, forgiveness, this whole thing. This was not John's MO. But, but he still, still directed people over and over and over again to Messiah, to Jesus. And, and he wanted to make sure along the way, there's a point earlier in the story where John is in prison and he's hearing about the things that Jesus is doing. And he sends one of his disciples. He had disciples too. People thought he was Messiah. People believed that he was the one because he was such a big character and he was proclaiming so much. There were people that followed John, even though he was pointing them towards Jesus. They followed him. So he, he from prison sends one of his disciples to Jesus to say, are you the one? Are you it? Is it really you? And Jesus doesn't say, he doesn't send the disciple back to say, yes, yes, I am. That's, that's it. He sends him back in, to say, I've seen. I've seen these miracles. I have seen people healed. I have seen, I've seen these things take place. So that John can know that the disciple has seen these things and it's, and it's happening. So he, he gave his whole life to the proclamation of the coming of Messiah. To, he gave his whole life to being about someone else. Completely and entirely about someone else. This is not easy work to do. And probably even especially when you are this big, bold personality like John was. He submitted his ego time and again to, to point to something beyond himself over and over again. And so, and so in the picture of, of his whole life, of all that he gave, I don't think our story could have been our story without John the Baptist. I don't, I don't think it could have been how it was without him. And so I feel like the purpose of putting this story of his death in the scripture is because we do have to tell the story of his death in the scripture. He has been so important. He has been so beloved by the disciples, by by his disciples, by the people who followed him, by all the people he baptized, by the people that he impacted over time, that to not tell his whole story would do a disservice. And isn't it true of all of us? Isn't it true that when someone is important to us, when someone is beloved of us, that we tell their story? We all, we all have our story. Everyone completely different and completely the same as everyone else, but each sacred. And so it's my belief today that these gospelers knew just how important John was, that they had to finish his story, that he was so beloved that they had to tell the whole story. Now for us, for us I think it gets a little sticky. We're out in the world where the world doesn't really want us to deal with death very much, right? Wants you kind of to, it can happen but then just be over it quickly. The world doesn't want you dealing with it too much or too loud or, or too prominently. We in church know that that's not how it goes. And we also have the benefit of knowing that, that death is just another part of this life that we live. That there is more 
than just what we're doing right now. We are living something that continues and that will keep going on. So we don't shy away from death here. This is an okay place to, to be with death and to honor that it's a part of the whole story. And so, and so we give thanks. We give thanks for the witness of John the Baptist, for, for the life that he gave, all to point toward something beyond himself, something greater even than he was. And it's without a doubt that even at the grave he made his song, as we say in our prayer book service, he made his song, Alleluia, Alleluia, Alleluia. He knew what he was here for. And so may he rest in peace and rise in glory, and may we give thanks for his story. Amen. Amen.